All right, good morning, everybody. So we've got, we have Burian on the other side of this. Uh, for those of you that are going to be watching at a later date uh, uh, off of YouTube, uh, make sure to print off. I've put a 22A uh, on everybody's desk here to be able to utilize and take notes as you go. I recommend that you do the same and have a hard copy of the 22A. We're going to be talking about a lot of other forms as well, but this will at least give you an idea as you kind of go through. You can kind of jot some notes. Uh, some things to note. First of all, I just want to start by saying, hey, um, one thing is important to know, and that is that we can always get a lot of our questions answered on forms by calling the MLS, reading the form itself. A lot of times the questions are really easy to answer if we just take the time to slow down and read the form. Also, on the MLS and Express Docs, right next to the form itself, there is a manual, and so you can also read the manual. Myself and Nalani and Russ, your sales managers, are really happy to help anytime answer questions about forms. Uh, so don't be bashful about calling, but you do have those resources that are available to you. So I just want to mention that at the beginning. Um, also, at the very beginning here, I just want to mention our next forms class uh, will be on Wednesday, August 28th. I know that's the end of the summer. Everybody's trying to get their stuff together, but we're going to keep succinct and do this the last Wednesday of every month going forward. Um, I had handed out sheets for everybody to uh, tell me what classes they wanted to have done. And uh, uh, the, ne the next class that we're going to do, one of the ones that was requested heavily was the 35E, the escalation addendum. So we'll talk about the escalation addendum, we'll talk about when to use it, when not to use it, how to use it, how not to use it, and maybe most importantly, how to take it off of a purchase and sale agreement once you, as the listing agent, have identified the property uh, that you want to go with and, uh, and want to move forward there and why that's important to eliminate that. So. Uh, Wednesday, the 28th of August, we will be covering that form. Fantastic. All right, let's get into it. We've got a lot to cover. I am going to ask that if you have any questions, just jot them down as we go. They may get answered as we go. Um, we'll take questions at the very end just to make sure that we can get through the content here in the next hour. Uh, and then if we are running over, then folks that have questions and want to listen to the answers can stick around and those that don't, don't need to. So, uh, all right, let's get started. So we have 22A up here. Pretty straightforward at the top, right? We're gonna put in the date of the agreement, the purchase and sale agreement date, uh, the buyer's names, the seller's names, and the address. All right, pretty straightforward. We get into uh, 22A number one, loan application and waiver of the contingency. So these are two separate parts, right? So first we have the, uh, the loan application itself. So we're gonna read A here. This agreement is contingent on the buyer obtaining the following type of loan or loans to purchase the property Conventional first, conventional second, bridge loan, VA, FHA, USDA, home equity line of credit, and other. All right, so clearly we need to fill in what our client is going to get. If we don't know, we need to find out before making the offer, right? Because we are telling the seller, or the, uh, yeah, we're telling the seller, if we're writing this as the buyer, uh, the type of financing that we're going to get. It's very important that we are relaying that information. It's also very important that it's accurate, and we'll talk about that in a minute. We go to the next slide. Can it I says, interject for a quick? I'm sorry, Jay. The yeah. other or the the number of loans, like the home equity line of credit, that's something to definitely talk to them about, though, too, because like Mark Dennison will say, a lot of banks don't like it when you use their home equity line of credit to obtain a mortgage, kind of thing. That's so right. You definitely the, want to communicate. That would the definitely, lender. yeah, and that would definitely be something that you have to you'll have to utilize as you go. You yeah. have to communicate to the lender, but also you have to communicate to the uh, to the seller. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, the next line, it talks about the buyer shall, and then it says it's got a box. You can put a dollar amount or a percentage amount, either one, uh, of the purchase price down. Now notice, this is going to tell us how much the, the client is going to put down to get the loan, right? That's great. We can put a number that's lower than they ultimately put down, but we cannot put a number that is higher. So if they see they're going to put down 20% and they find out later that they can get a better loan or a different loan and they only have to put down 10%, they can't make that change without the express written okay and signed off by the seller, okay? So uh, it's important, but if they put 10%, they could go 20%, they could do 50%, they could put down as much more as they want, just not less. We'll do questions at the end, so there's no way we're gonna get through all of this if we take questions now. Uh, in addition, uh, okay, so uh, buyer shall make application for the loans to pay the balance of the purchase price and pay the applicable fees if required for the subject property within five days, if not filled in. So five days is the 
default after mutual acceptance of this agreement. For the purpose of this addendum, application means the submission of the buyer's financial information for the purpose of obtaining an extension of a, of a credit, including the buyer's name, income, social security number, uh, if required, the property address, the purchase price, and the loan amount. Okay, so what is this talking about? This is simply just talking about, hey, you have, from the time of mutual acceptance, you have this amount of time in order to get your loan uh, application turned in, your, form, your formal loan application, right? So you've got five days. That's, that's what the default is. It can be reduced. Okay, fine. What does that mean, it, though, within those five days? What, what can I do within those five days? You can change lenders, yeah, absolutely. So a lot of people don't know that even though I've gotten an offer uh, for my listing that says, hey, it's gonna be using this lender that I feel comfortable with, the buyer can change the lender within those first five days or whatever's indicated there without asking uh, the seller for permission. They don't have to. Now, if the seller wants to make a deal contingent on the buyer utilizing that lender, they can do that. They just have to put that in the original purchase and sale agreement. That needs to be included. Otherwise, the buyer can change to a lender that maybe the uh, seller's not as thrilled about. So just a heads up, that can happen within the first five days. Let's go to the next portion, uh, B, the waiver of financing contingency here. Thanks, Sean, that's awesome, perfect. Uh, if the buyer fails to make application for financing for the property within the agreed time, changes the, loan or changes the type of loan at any time without the seller's Pre, uh, written consent, prior written consent, or changes the lender without the seller's written consent after the agreed upon time to apply for financing expires, then the financing contingency shall be deemed waived. Uh, waived. Let's put a pin in it right there for a second. So going back again, this says, hey, if you change the type of loan without notifying and getting permission from the seller at any time, even day one, if you had five days to make loan application, you can't change it without waiving your financing contingency. Obviously then putting your buyer's earnest money at risk, potentially depending on what other contingencies you have, right? Mm -hmm. It also expressly says here that they have, that they cannot change the lender after the five days, if you're, default, if you're using the default. So after the five days, if they want to change the lender, they have to get permission to do so, all right? Let's go back to this where it says buyer, uh, buyer's waiver of financing contingency under this paragraph 1B also constitutes waiver of paragraph 7, appraisal less than purchase price. All right, so this is a big, big problem, right? Again, if we miss this or if we end up waiving our financing contingency when we are not meaning to, that means that even the appraisal is going to be waived. So if the appraisal comes in low and your buyer can't buy or can't come to the table with the extra money, then we're talking about a loss of earnest money. For the purposes of this addendum, lenders, lender means either the party to whom the application is submitted or the party funding the loan. All right. So uh, it's kind of early in the class, but we are going to go to a video now. Uh, Annie Fitzsimmons does an amazing job of explaining uh, paragraph two of this form. Really not so much explaining the form itself, but explaining the mindset behind what is so important for listing agents to understand and for sellers to understand it as far as their rights in this addendum go. So we're going to go to that video now. We'll go ahead. Uh, Lonnie, why don't you go ahead and show it in Virian? We're going to go ahead and play it here now. Hi, I'm Lonnie Fitzsimmons. I'm the Washington Metro Simple Hotline lawyer. Today, in part two of this video series, we are going to talk about guess which paragraph? Two. Paragraph two of our financing agenda. And the title of the paragraph two is loan information. <clears throat> now, before we talk about the specifics of loan information, I want to talk a little theory with you. Let's talk about what the financing contingency is really all about. Here's what the financing contingency says. The financing contingency says, from buyer to seller, seller, I love your house, really want to own it, only problem is I have no idea if I can afford it. So, Recognizing that you could probably sell your house to another buyer, I'm asking you, please, take your house off the market and give me the opportunity to buy your house. 
And if you will do that, I'm going to make promises to you in return. And, and the very first promise I'm going to make to you is the promise set forth in paragraph 2 of Form 22A. And that promise goes like this. Tell them, I promise that I am going to use good faith to go get this loan. And I'm inviting you, seller, to confirm that I did that. I, I'm inviting you to stay 100% on top of my loan efforts so that you never have to wonder whether or not I'm making good faith forward progress in closing this loan in a way that's timely to close the purchase of the transaction. 422A, I'm sorry, yeah, 422A, paragraph 2, loan information, says from buyer to seller, seller, I invite you on day 10 following mutual acceptance, and 10 is the boilerplate default language, but it's really the right amount of time to use. It, it's enough time to give buyer opportunity to make their loan and get their um, disclosure documents back from the lenders so that buyers confirm with the lender that they're going to be going forward with. It invites the buyer invites seller on day 10 following mutual acceptance to send a form 22 a l to the buyer and that's a request for loan information form 22 a l says to buyer buyer you have three days following receipt of this 22 a l to respond to me using the form 22 a p this is one of the very few instances in the statewide forms where the the form that buyer has to use is mandated by the forms themselves. Form 22A says that buyer must respond on Form 22AP. Why? Because Form 22AP provides the guidelines for all of the information that buyer is required to give to seller. Form 22AP requires that the buyer provide number one, the identification of the lender with whom buyer made loan application. Number two, a uh, check mark box representation of all of the documents that buyer has already provided to the lender. Number three, a warranty that buyer has provided to buyer's lender all of the documents that lender is seek, has, has asked for buyer to provide so far. In other words, everything the lender has asked of me, I have already delivered to the lender. There's nothing outstanding. It's not like the lender's been asking me for my tax returns and I've been saying, yeah, 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 I'll get to it when I get to it. Everything the lenders ask me for, I provide it. That's the third element of the 22 AP. And then the last part of the 22 AP is really the B. The, the last portion of the 22 AP is buyer's agreement or buyer's instruction to buyer's lender to provide information to both listing broker and seller upon listing broker's or seller's request. And there is no limit on the number of times that listing broker and seller can ask lender for information. If, if listing broker wants to call buyer's lender every hour on the hour, they can do that. It would be a really bad idea, but they can do that. It would be an equally bad idea for listing brokers to sit on their hands and never make contact with buyer's lender, to never follow up with what's the status of buyer's loan. Listing brokers, I want you to understand, I want this really to penetrate what we've said in this video. The financing contingency is buyer's request of seller, please take your property off the market while I go and try and find a loan. And, and that is a huge favor for you seller to give me buyer a complete stranger to you. So in return, here is the promise I make to you. When you ask for confirmation, of my good faith efforts, I will give you that confirmation. Listing brokers, buyer is inviting seller to get this information from buyer. You are not being overly aggressive or burdensome or anything else when you, uh, uh, on behalf of seller, submit a timely 22 AL to the buyer's broker. Instead, you are complying with the standard of care required of a lawyer, the standard of care to which you are held, when you both select and fill in the blanks on the pre-printed standardized purchase and sale agreement forms. If a lawyer were representing seller, 
Would the lawyer recommend a seller that they go get that information that buyer offered up through their terms in the financing contingency? If you reach a conclusion, yes, a lawyer would do that, which I hope you do reach that conclusion, then you're right. And that is the standard of care to which you will be held as you advise seller through the use of the Form 22A. We're ending this video uh, discussing paragraph two with that statement. When our next video will pick up with the discussion of paragraph three, and it's going to feed right off the end of this video. So um, hang on for that discussion. If you have any other questions, though, between now and next Friday, send an email to me, legal hotline at warealtor.org. Thank you for being a Washington Realtor. All right, are you finished up over there, Nalani? Sorry, go ahead again. We're back. You're back? Okay, perfect. So, we'll talk about some of those forms that she had mentioned, um, but the, the thing, the big takeaway on this that I really want everybody to get is just simply, hey, at the end of the day, as listing agents, are we utilizing this uh, these resources for our seller, right? Are we doing this? And I'll tell you, as a, as a company or as, a, as offices, we're not, at, 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 um, in general, we're not utilizing this nearly enough. At the end of the day, what does she say? It is our duty, basically, to do this, representing our sellers, because it will help them as we go through. We'll talk a little bit about that when we hit those forms. So let's get into reading that. So number two, the loan information. Uh, number two, letter A, sell request for loan information at any time, 10 days after, uh, uh, I'm sorry, at any time, 10 days is the default, after mutual acceptance, seller may give notice once, a notice requesting information related to the status of the buyer's loan application. Request for loan information. MLS form 22AL may be used for this notice, which we will show you in a second. But again, remember she said 10 days is the default, and that's probably about right in order to do this. Now let's go ahead and real quick, John, can we throw up the AL? Yeah, the 22 AL. So let's look at this real briefly, just so we can see, well, what does the form look like? Clearly there's not a whole lot on here. Request for loan information. Pursuant to section two of the financing and debt of 22A, sell requests that buyer give notice of the status of buyer's loan application. Buyer shall use the loan information notice form 22AP for that notice. Okay, great. So this is just giving them notice. Hey, they need to tell you where they are uh, with the process of the loan. Let's go ahead and see the 22AP. Awesome. So here, if we get, if we come down to the meat, uh, where it says buyer uh, presents and warrants the following information is true and correct, and then it starts to get into it. Buyer made loan application included, uh, which included a buyer's name, income, social security number, if required, the property address, purchase price, and the loan amount the, uh, on such and such a date to such and such a lender. Whoa. Okay, hold on a second. So they have to tell you which lender they're using. Is this important? This has big value, right? Have anybody had somebody change a lender and you don't even know about it until the end? So by enacting the 22AL, right, which then makes them fill out a 22AP, they have to tell you what lender they use. You're not going to get blindsided later. Maybe they did it in the first five days and it was totally legit and there's no problem with that, but you didn't know. Maybe they did it afterwards and you can find that out because it says right here, Boom, it had to be done on that loan. Uh, uh, it was the, the loan application was done on this date. So, uh, and then the next uh, sentence or the next little paragraph says, buyer authorizes listing firm, <coughs> listing broker, and seller to contact a lender to inquire about the status of the buyer's loan approval at any time before closing. I will execute an authorization form. If required by letter to accomplish the same. So you can see here, we're not gonna go through these, but you can see here, these are all the things that the buyer needs to make warranty about, right? The buyer has to tell you about. Now again, up here, uh, what we just read, that is your permission that Amy Fitzsimmons was talking about. That's your permission, that's the buyer telling you, go ahead, contact the listing, or uh, the lender, <laughs> right? She said, don't call every day, that's probably not the best idea, but you could, right? This is their invitation for you to reach out and to be in contact with the lender. John, let's scroll to the bottom there. 
Uh, and the last little bit here, buyer provide or buyer has provided lender with the above information and any additional information lender has required the buyer to provide to a lender before the date of this notice. All right. This kicks in something very interesting. So let's go back to the uh, 22A and let's go. Let's go to. Um, oh, let's see here. Where are we? We are at failure to provide. Right? So now they provided the 22 uh, AP, or I'm sorry, the 22 AL. So we're actually, I'm sorry, so we're actually going to uh, 2B, number two, letter B. A buyer's loan information notice within three days, if not filled in, of receiving the seller's request for loan application, the buyer shall give notice of the status of the buyer's loan application using the 22 AP, right? The buyer's notice shall be on the 22, the MLS form 22 AP, okay, and shall include the date of application, the name of the lender, uh, list of the information. This is just talking about what we just read, what we just saw on the 22 AP. Letter C says, failure to provide loan information notice. All right, this is kind of a big one, okay? If the buyer fails to timely give the seller a completed loan information notice, the seller may give the right to terminate notice described in paragraph three, which we will get to, uh, seller's right to terminate at any time after the date that the loan information notice is due. Generally, you would have 30 days as the default, we'll talk about that in just a minute, to, to wait through as a seller to give the notice to terminate, which gives us options, basically. It doesn't mean that we're terminating, but it gives us options, okay, as, as a, a, on the list side. But what this is saying is, hey, if you, if you give them that uh, 22 AL and they don't respond on a 22 AP in a timely manner within the three days, you can jumpstart that process of putting them on notice. And we'll get into just what that looks like here as we go into section three, seller's right to terminate. Section three, letter A, right to terminate notice. At any time, 30 days if not filled in, after mutual acceptance, seller may give notice that the seller may, may terminate the agreement at any time, three days after delivery of that notice. That's the MLS form 22AR may be used for this notice. Let's go ahead and bring that one up, John, on the page, on this screen. 22AR. Okay, so, uh, here, let me go to my 22AR in hand. Okay, so this gives the seller, uh, this, is the, this is a notice form. So what we have here, the, the first option here, this is what you would use in this case. Seller's right to terminate. Seller hereby gives notice that the buyer does not, uh, if the buyer does not waive fi the financing contingency, the seller may terminate this agreement anytime three days after delivery of this notice. All right? This is just a notice to the buyer. If you have a contract that closes in 40 days and you've got a 30-day stipulation here, you can implement this. In fact, as a listing agent, you should implement this. This does not say that you're terminating the agreement. It simply says, we're putting you on notice. If you don't waive your financing contingency between now and closing, there's a seven-day gap in this, in this uh, uh, option or in, in this uh, example. Um, where we could, if we felt that you weren't making a good faith effort or we felt you weren't going to close, or even if we just wanted to because somebody else came in, we could then uh, terminate this agreement. You're not doing your sellers the best job that you can if you are not taking advantage of, of uh, uh, dispersing this and giving this. Um, there's, then there's, uh, on this one, there's also the seller's notice. Uh, the termination, the one under it, seller hereby gives notice that the seller elects to terminate this agreement, seller's instructions to the party holding the earnest money to disperse the earnest money to the buyer. This is the notice that they would give the three days later if they decided to go ahead and, as a seller, terminate the agreement. You notice that it does give the earnest money back to the buyer uh, in this case. And just, just a note, you'll need a, a 50 also in order to do this because an escrow company will not just take this notice of termination and disperse earnest money. They won't. Uh, they need a 50, which the 50, remember a, a 51 is a termination, but a 50 is the disbursement of the earnest money. That's all the 50 is. So you would want a 50 along with this form. The last uh, part of this form just says that the buyer's notice of waiver of financing contingency. So this just says, hey, 
the buyer can choose this option as a response to the seller's initial right to terminate notice and say, hey, we're going to go ahead and um, uh, waive our financing contingency and move forward. Now, they don't have to do that. And again, that notice is not saying that the buyer or that the seller is terminating. It's just giving the seller the option if necessary. So uh, I don't know. What does that really tell us as a buyer's agent? What do we probably want to do? Well, we probably want that time period, that, that default 30 days, to line up fairly well with our closing date as a buyer's agent, right? Because we don't want a big gap in between there. I would rather not be giving notice uh, or, or getting notice on day 30, which means by day 33, I'm in a danger zone if I don't close until day 40. So if I'm not closing for 40 days, I might want to put that portion out 37 days, right? So it lines up a little bit better with my closing. It makes sense. Uh, so something to think about as you are filling this out for your buyers. Awesome. Uh, let's go back to the uh, 22A, please, John. All right, so we're going to be, we're, this, uh, this lines us up at uh, 22, uh, 3, letter B. So the bottom of the first page, termination notice. If the buyer has not previously waived the financing contingency, seller may give notice of the right to terminate this agreement, uh, which is the termination notice. Any time following three days after the, the delivery of the right to terminate notice, if seller gives termination notice before buyer has waived the financing contingency, this agreement is terminated, but in the earnest money shall be refunded to the buyer. MLS form 22AR should be used for this notice. If not waived, the financing contingency shall survive the closing date. I'm not going to get too far into this for time, but one thing to understand about the financing contingency is unless it's waived or unless the seller utilizes it to get out of the agreement, it survives everything. It's going to go through the end and then. So at the end of the day, uh, that is an important concept here to understand that it does keep going. Now, if we go to letter C, letter C is an interesting part of this. I get a lot of questions about letter C uh, on the 22A. So follow me with this, please. Appraisal less than sales price, okay? Buyer's waiver of financing contingency under paragraph three will or will not, you get to make a choice will or will not constitute the waiver of paragraph seven, appraisal less than sales price. There is a clear winner and a clear loser depending on which box you check, okay? So if you check the will box, that is better for the seller. And note, the default is will, right? So this is saying, hey, if you are waiving your financing contingency, or you're, you're um, yeah, if you're waiving your financing contingency, it will also waive your appraisal contingency. Check the box will, that's what it does. Check the box will not, and that is better for your buyer. It says, no, if we waive the financing contingency, we still have intact our contingency based on the appraisal, on a low appraisal, right? So for most offers, if you're not in a multiple offer situation, as a buyer, you're probably wanting to check that box that says will not, right? Because at the end of the day, if you find yourself in a position where you are either forced to or choose to waive your financing contingency, at least then your appraisal contingency will still be intact. Let's go to the next page. Page two, loan costs and provisions. Seller shall pay up to X amount in dollars or percentage of the purchase price. All right, what is this? This is when we are asking the seller for a rebate, right, of some sort. Maybe we adjust the price up and ask for closing costs back. This is, this is where we're going to put in the amount that we want the seller to pay. We're going to read the rest of this paragraph in a second. We're not going to talk too much about it, but we're going to talk right now about kind of what this is and how this is used, right? So we know that we have the ability when writing an offer to ask for the seller to pay money towards our closing costs. This is where you're going to ask for it. You'll put a percentage or a dollar amount. I highly recommend that you check with your lender before you're putting in dollar amounts, right? Sometimes we'll, we'll see situations where, uh, in fact, a lot of times with companies, uh, other companies that have more than one person handling a transaction, one person may not know what the other is doing. And so we find ourselves in, in situations where a buyer may ask for, let's say, $10,000 in closing costs, but the actual closing costs are 
6,500. Now there's a lot of extra money, right? Where does that money go? Well, they gotta figure it out. And if they can't figure out where it goes, where does it ultimately go? Right. Come back to the seller. Yeah, it goes right back to the seller. Now there are a lot of things that you can use. You can prepay taxes sometimes. You can pay your mortgage down. You can pay for a home warranty. Um, there, there's a lot of different ways to utilize that. But if it doesn't get caught until the end, it can be too late to change and reutilize that money and still close on time. So it is important that the dollar amount that you put there is something that you can actually spend. Also, you can only go up so high. You can only get so much money back in closing costs. So if you ask for closing costs and then you're negotiating the price of a roof on an inspection contingency, and you're like, well, we already got 10,000 for closing costs, let's just get another 15,000 for the roof. Well, that's not gonna work, right? You're not going to be able to pay for the roof out of that. So you have to pay attention to what you're putting in there. Let's go ahead and read that paragraph. Though. Question for you, John. Yeah. So, or, so let, let's, let's do this. Let's, questions at the end. Okay. Well, uh, at the beginning, I'm sorry, you, you came in just, just past when we started. But let's just write it down now. We'll, we'll take them at the end. For sure. Okay. Um, okay, so purchase price. Uh, so the seller agrees. The seller shall pay up to X amount of the purchase price. Zero, if not filled in, which shall be applied to buyers. Loans and settlement costs, including prepaid, loan discount, loan fee, interest, uh, interest buy down, financing, uh, closing, and or other allowed costs by the lender. All right. The amount shall include the costs, uh, the following costs that the lender is prohibited from collecting from buyer, uh, up to $300 of the buyer's loan, and the settlement costs for FHA, USDA, VA loans, and unless agreed by both parties, or, or I'm sorry, agreed otherwise below, the buyer shall buyer's share of the escrow fee for a VA loan. Seller may or so shall pay the costs for A and B even if the amount agreed upon in this paragraph four is insufficient to pay for those closing costs. The next part is something that we have to pay attention to if we've got a VA loan. If checked, and then it has a box, the buyer shall pay the buyer's share of escrow fee for the VA loan. Note that VA regulations prohibit a buyer from paying loan and settlement costs exceeding 1% of the loan. So the buyer can choose to pay their, uh, their share of the escrow fees, okay? Which is traditionally in a VA loan, not the case. Cool, that's where it is. The next section has to do with your earnest money. If the buyer has not waived the financing contingency, and is unable to obtain financing by closing after a good faith effort, then on buyer's notice, this agreement shall terminate. All right, so that sounds like, hey, if we decide we can't get the loan or we think we can't get the loan, we can go ahead and, and move on. And that's true, but there are some catches to that. There are some things that have to be met. The earnest money shall be refunded to the buyer after the lender confirms in writing. Oh boy, now we've got things that the lender has to actually, in writing, provide to the listing agent, the seller, to say, hey, no, they really weren't able to get their loan. They just didn't get cold feet and back out. Those things are, the, are the, there are three things. They are the date they have to provide in writing, the date the buyer's loan application for the property was made, including a copy of the loan estimate that was provided to the buyer. Well, what's that going to do? That's going to point out if, in fact, the buyer didn't make formal loan application until after the five days if we use the default, right? So here's where we're going to find out, well, if they didn't make formal loan application until day seven, well, guess what? Then the financing contingency is waived. And that earnest money is definitely in jeopardy, extreme jeopardy, right? Uh, the second thing that they have to ask for, the buyer, uh, the, the lender will have to provide that the buyer possessed sufficient funds to close, i.e. down payment, closing costs, etc. And the third thing is the reasons the buyer was un unable to obtain financing by closing. So they have to prove it, right? They have to prove, hey, we really truly couldn't get financing. We can't just send a notice saying, hey, we couldn't get financing. If seller terminates this agreement, the earnest money shall be refunded to the buyer without need for such confirmation. So if we go back and remember the, in the past uh, example, if we go back and we say, okay, well, the, uh, the, the seller gave notice of termination after their 30 days, but we still have seven more or, or, or 10 more days to close. We get through the first three days and the seller, let's say, 
you know, in that seven day window decides, hey, you know what, on day four of that seven day window before closing, they decide, you know what, let's, let, let's pull the plug, we've got something better or whatever it is. If the seller decides to do that, then the buyer doesn't have to prove that they didn't get the loan because the seller is pulling the plug on that and the earnest money goes back. The earnest money will go back. So uh, number six, inspection. Something to note, all right, even if you waive your inspection contingency in a transaction, it doesn't mean that there will not be an inspection on the home. Most likely there will not, but as part of your financing contingency, there is an inspection portion here that talks about what the lender needs, right, in order to uh, approve the property and go ahead and, and, and uh, lend on the property. So this uh, number six says, inspection seller shall permit inspections required by the lender, including but not limited to structural, pest, heating, plumbing, roofing, electrical, septic, and well inspections. They can ex inspect just about anything if they need to, right? If the appraiser comes out and says, we need an inspector to come out and check this out. Does it happen often? No. Can it happen? Yeah, absolutely. And your seller is agreeing to allow it by agreeing to a financing contingency as part of their purchase and sale agreement. All right? Seller's not obligated to pay for such inspections unless otherwise agreed. So clearly the seller's not paying for that but they have to allow it. Something for you to understand, even when you're waiving your financing contingency, or I'm sorry, your inspection contingency. This supersedes that. All right, uh, number seven. All right, we're gonna kind of get into one of the more fun parts about this form. There's a lot in this form, right? Mm -hmm. There really is a ton of meat in this form, which is kind of why we decided to start with this one when it comes to the forms classes, because I think there's a lot of things to use here uh, and to understand. So. Number seven, appraisal less than sales price. <laughs> Buckle up. Notice of low appraisal. If the lender's appraised value of the property is less than the purchase price, so appraisal comes in low, buyer may, I'm going to stop right there, buyer may give notice of low appraisal. So it does not say that the buyer is required to give notice of low appraisal. It simply says that they may. If the buyer gets notice of low appraisal, it's a $100,000 house, the appraisal comes in at $95,000, it's a difference of $5,000. The buyer can choose not to give a notice to the seller and bring the $5,000 to closing. And in fact, a lot of times they may do that. There's multiple offers, they know that other people want the property, they know the seller won't adjust. Enacting the next part, and we're gonna to get to it in a minute, but enacting the next part and giving the notice kind of uh, creates a situation where everybody's kind of pigeonholed into some specific and limited or limiting uh, um, um, options. All right. So again, they may uh, uh, give the notice within three days after receipt of a copy of the lender's appraisal, give notice of low appraisal, which shall include a copy of the lender's appraisal. That's MLS form 22AN, which John's going to go ahead and pop up there right now for me, please. Thank you, sir. May be used uh, for the notice in this paragraph 7. So let's check out the AN for a second here. We are not going to get too in-depth into the AN. We just simply don't have time for it. And it's not necessary today. We will cover the 22AN, uh, the notice of low appraisal, at a future class. But uh, just, just to note at the top, buyer gives notal, notice that let buyer's lender appraised value of the property is less than the purchase price of the property. A copy of the lender's appraisal is attached to this notice. You have to, you have to attach the appraisal, right? Makes perfect sense. And then we start to get into seller's response and, and kind of the back and forth that can come from this. We're not going to do too much of that today. So John, let's go ahead and bump back to the 22A. Grab a little sip of water here. Okay, so uh, so now we're, we're now we're, we're catching back up at seven B, seller's response. Okay, so if the buyer does choose to give notice of low appraisal, then the the seller shall have ten days within ten days after buyer's notice of low appraisal, give notice of acceptable to lender in an amount not less than the purchase price, the buyer shall promptly seek lender's approval of such reappraisals or reconsiderations of the value. The parties are advised that the lender may elect 
not to accept a reappraisal or consideration of value. Okay, that's what does this mean? So this says, hey, one of the options that the seller can do is say, hey, well, let's try to figure this out. Or the, I'm sorry, not the lender, the, the seller can do is say, hey, let's try to figure this out and get a new appraisal. Okay, just a heads up, that's difficult to do. Very difficult to do. One of the things that it says right here, it has to be approved or acceptable to the buyer's lender. Good luck with that, because usually they only have one company that they're willing to, to do from. Now also, even if you got a second appraisal, and that second appraisal was higher, a lender will often not accept it and just stick with the first one. They could do that. They could take the difference and, and meet you in the middle. They could take that second appraisal. It is not an ideal situation and it takes a lot of time. We know how long appraisals can take. So th uh, that is an option to the seller. Uh, B number two, I, I, the seller's consent to reduce the purchase price to the amount that is not more than the amount specified in the appraisal or reappraisal by the same appraiser or an appraisal by another appraiser acceptable to the lender, whichever is higher. That's basically what we were just talking about. This provision is not acceptable if the agreement is conditioned under uh, a condition on FHA, VA, or USDA financing. Okay? Hey, FHA, VA, and USDA financing does not permit a buyer to be obligated to buy uh, if the seller reduces the purchase price to the appraised value. Buyer, however, has the option to buy at the reduced price. Notice, right, FHA, that's FHA loan. The appraisal comes in low, let's say it's $100,000 uh, purchase price, and it comes in at $95,000, and the seller says, hey, okay, we'll come down to ninety-five. dollars That buyer does not still need to purchase the property. Hmm. It's already agreed. You're agreeing as a listing agent when you accept a 22A that they don't have to purchase the property, even if the, the seller is willing to come down in the purchase price. The third option here, seller's proposal to reduce the purchase price to an amount more than the amount specified in the appraisal and for buyer to pay the necessary additional funds, uh, the amount, the reduced purchase price exceeds the appraised value to close the sale or another option. I want to point out on that, that is the option to kind of split the difference, right? They're saying, hey, it came in at 95,000, our agreement is 100,000, the seller says, you know what, we'll, we'll sell it to you for 98,000 and you better come up with the other three grand. Okay, those are kind of your options. Or that, that is one of your options. The last option here is that seller uh, rejects the buyer's notice of low appraisal. Okay, if seller delivers, uh, if seller timely delivers notice of either a reappraisal or reconsideration value, consent to reduce the purchase price to the amount not more than the amount specified in the appraisal, except for VHA, uh, or FHA, VA, or USDA financing, and the lender accepts responsible, uh, and seller accepts, I'm sorry, and lender accepts seller's response, then buyer shall be bound by buyer's response. Well, let's get into the next part, because the next part's kind of interesting too. Uh, the buyer's reply. Well, first, actually, before we do that, what happens if the 10 days, remember here uh, in a 7B, it's within 10 days of, of receiving the buyer's notice of low appraisal. What happens if the seller does not respond within those 10 days? Yeah. Uh, earnest money refunded to buyer. Earnest money refunded to buyer. Termination. Termination. No. No, it doesn't. And in fact, we just talked about this in a past meeting about an agent that had a, a situation where they were purchasing a property, they got through the, first, the the low appraisal went in, they gave notice of low appraisal, they went through the 10 days, right? And then after the 10 days, they went, okay, hey, it's it's done, the, the seller has to now sell to me for the new low price, the appraisal price. But that's not the case at all. In fact, it is as if the seller had said, no, I'm not doing anything. And now the next time period, now the next time frame, comes into play and that's the, that's your buyer's three-day period to respond back to either the response from the seller or the non-response from the seller it's the same the non-response is a response it's a response that they're not going to adjust anything okay it's important to understand that all right buyers reply reply buyers shall have three days from either seller's notice of rejection of low appraisal or if the seller fails to respond the day the seller responds uh, response period ends, whichever is earlier. This is what we just talked about, right? Um, 
I'm sorry, I stopped in the middle of the sentence. But uh, at A, their waiver, let's, re let's restart this. Buyer shall have three days from either the seller's notice of rejection of low appraisal or if the seller fails to respond the day the seller's response period ends, whichever is earlier to A, waive the financing contingency, or B, terminate the agreement in which event the earnest money shall be refunded to buyer. Okay, this is what we were talking about before when we said, hey, the buyer has the option to give the notice because what's happening here? The buyer gets kind of pigeonholed into a corner, right? They're kind of stuck. You give notice, the seller comes back and says, we're not doing anything or we'll give you this amount of money or whatever it is. Anything other than them saying, yeah, we're going to give you exactly what the appraisal price is results in the buyer having to make a very difficult decision. They can do only one of two things. They're stuck in a corner. They can either terminate the agreement, get their earnest money back, and move on because it didn't appraise, so they have that contingency within the contract. Or they can come back and say, what? We waive, we waive our financing contingency. Anybody a big fan of waiving their financing contingency? No, of course not. No, 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 right? That's not something that we necessarily want to do. Now, can we? Are there situations where it could make sense? Absolutely. However, it's not something that we would want to do or would, would ever want to be in the habit of doing. So again, this kind of plays back to the, your buyer has to make a decision when they get a low appraisal. What are they going to do? It's not necessarily, okay, we got a low appraisal. Now let's give them notice. There's a decision to be made, and you need to be able to, to articulate that to your buyer. All right, uh, back down to C. Uh, C2 there, the very bottom of the page. If the seller's, uh, if the, se I'm sorry, if seller proposes to reduce the purchase price to an amount more than the appraised value, buyer shall have three days to accept uh, and uh, present, represent, that the buyer has sufficient funds to close the sale in accordance with the provision or B, terminate the agreement in which case earnest money shall be refunded to buyer. So again, it goes back to saying, hey, yeah, they can say, fine, we'll meet you in the middle if that's the option that the seller gives. But again, if they don't want to meet them in the middle, then we're stuck again. Then we're stuck again. All right. Let's go ahead and bounce to the last page. You guys doing okay over there? That's a lot in here, right? We're 50 minutes in. Ton of information. And we are going to kind of cruise through this last page and hit some questions. There is some interesting things on the last page. A lot of it has to do with FHA, VA, and USDA loans. We're not going to get too much in the weeds with that, but we are going to we are going to go over this. We're going to read it through, and we're also going to pinpoint some things I think that are important. Okay. Um, a continuation of page two is where we start. Uh, page uh, three. Uh, this again has to do with the response back. I'm sorry, I forgot that we've got one more section of that. If the seller consents to reduce the price. Uh, the purchase price to the amount not more than the appraised value for FHA, VA, or USDA financing, buyer shall have three days to give notice that buyer will buy the price, the uh, reduced price, will buy at the reduced price or terminate the agreement, in which case they get their earnest money back. All right, again, so this goes back to they have the choice, VA, uh, FHA, or USDA buyers have the choice and they have to actually say what they're going to do. Buyers in action during this reply period. So, if the seller doesn't re reply, and then the buyer doesn't reply, or if the seller replies, knows the low appraisal, but and, and enacts the three-day seller response period, but the buyer doesn't respond, buyer's inaction during this reply period shall result in the termination of the agreement and return of the earnest money to the buyer. Closing date shall be extended as necessary to accommodate uh, the foregoing uh, times, the foregoing times for notices. Okay, so it kills the deal. Okay? It doesn't continue it if the buyer fails to continue. Number eight, uh, FHA, VA, and USDA. Again, we're not going to get too caught up in this, but I will read it out because <clears throat> you all enjoy hearing me read, I know. Uh, <laughs> US, uh, FHA, VA, USDA appraisal certificate. If this agreement is contingent on buyer obtaining FHA, VA, or USDA, USDA financing, notwithstanding any other provisions of this agreement, Buyer is not obliged, obligated, sorry, to complete the purchase of the property unless buyer has been given in accordance with HUD, FHA, VA, or USDA requirements, a written statement by FHA, VA, USDA, or 
a direct endorsement letter setting forth the appraised value of the property in excluding closing costs. The seller and buyer shall execute a document setting forth a prior provision or similar provision known as the FHA VA or USDA inventory clause as required by the lender. The buyer shall pay the cost of any appraisal if the appraised, if the appraised value of the property is less than the purchase price. Paragraph 7 will be applied, which again, paragraph 7 is what? Yeah, it's the it's the notice for uh, um, a low appraisal, right? And having that appraisal uh, contingency. The purpose of the appraisal. This applies to U.S. Uh, or to FHA, VA, and USDA only. Pur the purpose of appraisal, the appraised uh, valuation, is arrived at only to determine the maximum mortgage for FHA, VA, or USDA or that USDA will ensure FHA, VA, or USDA do not warrant the value or condition of the property. The buyer agrees to satisfy himself or herself that the price and condition of the property are acceptable. Okay, great. Let's move to the last paragraph and we'll have time for some questions here. The last paragraph has to do with extension of closing. Do we know that we have, does everybody know that there is a built-in extension of closing into your contract? I'm not sure that we all do. Now, it's only built in if you're utilizing a 22A, of course, right? If 22A is part of your purchase and sale agreement. <clears throat> but it is, and it's right here, number nine. Extension of closing. If through no fault of the buyer's lend, or I'm sorry, if through no fault of buyer, lender is required by 12 CFR 1026 to give corrected disclosure to buyer due to a change in the annual percentage rate, of the buyer's loan by 0.125% or more for a fixed rate loan or quarter of a percent or more for an adjustable rate loan or B, a change in the loan product or C, the addition of a prepayment penalty, then upon notice from buyer, the closing agent or the close date shall be extended for up to four days to accommodate the requirements of Regulation Z in the Truth in Lending Act. This paragraph shall survive the buyer's waiver of financing contingency. So there's a couple things in there I want to point out. <clears throat> One, what is this really talking about? What, what enables them to get an extension? If something changes with the lender, but really, really, this has to do with the notice, right? This really has to do with the closing disclosure that the lender has to give to the buyer, right? We all know that the lender has to give a buyer a closing disclosure. The buyer has to sign off on that uh, a disclosure. This is not new to us now, but this was new, what, a couple of years or so ago, right? They have to give this notice to the buyer. The buyer has to sign it. The buyer can't cl sign closing documents with escrow until this is signed. Well, what this is saying is, hey, if it gets sent and the lender and signed, and the lender goes, oops, we have to do a new one or anything happens there with that document where it requires that the that the buyer re-sign or maybe even assign sign initially this document then an extension can be granted and in fact is being granted by the seller the seller is agreeing to this stipulation the other part of this is that the last the last sentence where it says this paragraph shall survive the buyer's waiver of financing that matters, right? Mm -hmm. Because if this pushes us off and past the time limit allowed for their, their financing contingency or past closing or whatever that is, again, remember the financing contingency will continue even past closing, right? In this case, closing would get extended. So it would be pushing back into that extended closing period. This, but this goes even if you waive financing. This goes even if you waive financing. If they're getting financing, they have got to be able legally under the Truth in Lending Act to, to receive, acknowledge, and accept that disclosure from the, from the lender. So with that, we are done with the form. We also, oh, no, I'm sorry. We haven't covered the 90I. So just real briefly, the 90I is a quick one. You want to throw that one up there? The 90I is the buyer's notice to terminate because the financing fell through. So if you're giving the notice saying, hey, we can't get it, remember, 
Remember, right, from uh, page two of the financing contingency, number five, the buyer must supply the information from the lender, right? So they're still gonna have to supply that, but this is the notice that you would use, the 90I, to terminate a contract if you're the buyer because you were unable to obtain financing. You would send this, you'd send the letter from the lender that says, hey, they couldn't get it, they applied on this date, which was within the five days, they had the, the, the money to, to do this and whatever the other, the, the, other, the third stipulation uh, is in that, again, number five on your 22A. So you would include that letter from the bank and you would include a form 50, right? Which again allows the lender to disperse the earnest money to where it's supposed to go. Sorry, escrow, thank you, Karen, yes, escrow, of course. Good, all right, we're done with the form. There's questions? Yes, no? Let's start with a question here in West Seattle and then uh, Nalani, let's, we'll, we'll, come, we'll, we'll kind of go back and forth. Yeah? If there's any questions over there. Uh, so Sam, you've got one, what's up? Yeah, um, just out of curiosity, so if you have a buyer and they have a home and they applied for a second mortgage to buy their new home to move into before they sell their old home, would that be considered a conventional second loan? Say if they, basically if they already have a mortgage and they're buying a second property. No, a second, a second, we don't see them nearly as much anymore. Uh, Karen has seen a lot of them a long time ago, right? We were getting first and seconds. Uh, it, it is a second loan on the original property. So a first loan for 80% of the value of the property and then a second for 20%. That's how we used to do 100% loans, which is what destroyed the marketplace, right? That tanked the economy in the United States of America. So, well, I don't know, you can argue with whatever. But at the end of the day, it allows, the, the second is what was allowing for those 100% loans. Yeah. Very, very rare that I see a second anymore on anything. In fact, I don't know that I've seen one since the crash of the market. Uh, Burian, do we have Burian on the mic? Sure. Nolani? I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm listening to the question. Um, the question we had here was just clarification that even on a VA loan, a hundred thousand dollar purchase, if the appraisal came in at ninety thousand, the buyer still has the opportunity to come in with the additional ten, even on a VA loan. That's accurate. Yes. You can bring. We have a second question. Okay, go ahead. You got, let's just roll with you guys for a minute. Yeah. The second question is, what happens during, during if in the middle of a transaction, a buyer after making up, after making an application, after making the offer, makes a large purchase, i.e., a car, without disclosing to the lender, and that affects debt to income and. Then what happens? Yeah, so if it affects their debt to income, it definitely can affect their loan. No question about it. In my experience, those situations have actually constituted uh, a, re uh, a, a refund of their earnest money because they were unable to get the financing. Now, it could be argued you could definitely find yourself in a position where the seller could uh, fight for the earnest money and giving the, the idea that, hey, well, this says good faith effort, uh, and you were not able to obtain the financing due to no fault of your own, but you were a bozo and you went and bought a huge truck, right? And so that's kind of fault of your own. Again, ultimately, then you're going to be fighting for earnest money. So there are going to be situations, well, in, in everything, we, we all know that there are situations that are pretty gray. And any time that we're dealing with an earnest money situation, we as agents have to be really careful. We can never tell a client, yes, you'll get your earnest money back, or no, you won't. Or as a listing agent, yes, if they do this, you're going to get their earnest money. Because Maybe. That, that, is, that is definitely up for debate. Could we turn... Not off the video where we're just hearing your responses. Okay, let's. I don't know. Can we turn the video off so they can all hear me? Perfect. Okay. Any other questions over there? I think. Let's go to the questions in here. What else we got? So you mentioned that um, on 
Unfortunately, they're on a wireless. Okay, device. hold on. Let's let's mute your info. Melanie, we're going to mute you for a second. Great. Um, hold, hold, hold on. Hold Thank on. you. I think we have to be back. Okay. All right. A little technical difficulty. We're going to mute you guys for a second. We've got a question over here. We're going to we're going to mute you because we're getting a lot of uh, noise coming from yours. Yes. Um, the question speak up loud so that video can catch it up. We asked for ten grand back in closing costs, and it only comes to sixty five hundred. You said that we use that money for things. Do we have to submit a form to get that money used for something else, or just how? Good question. Work? So the question is, if we ask for ten thousand in closing costs, we're representing the buyer, and the closing costs just come in at six thousand, then do we need to have a form or something? To, to, to utilize the extra 4,000, how do we do that? And the answer to that is no, you don't need a form. You don't need to tell the seller what you're doing at all with that money. You just have to come to an arrangement with your uh, uh, lender as to what they will allow and how much money can be as, uh, assigned to different things. And again, do we find ourselves in a position where there's extra money? Yes, and that actually happens fairly often. Uh, it's just generally in smaller amounts. But sometimes when using, uh, my big example is Redfin. I, Redfin paid for a cruise for two of my clients, two separate transactions where they asked for a ton of money back and then at the end of the day, and were given it in the contract and at the end of the day, uh, they didn't utilize all that money and we could see on the final uh, statement coming from escrow that hey, in fact the buyer was, the, the seller was gonna be getting back another 25 or 3,000 or $3,500 of that closing cost. So that's what, it, it's really important to be paying attention to that and it's equally important to be talking to your lender and finding out really what are my closing costs, right? And trying to sister that up kind of close. Good question. Any other questions here in West Seattle? Yeah, Kelly. Uh, regarding appraisal less than sale price, I want to make sure I understand the risk of giving notice of low appraisal. If the seller rejects the buyer's notice of low appraisal, I'm understanding that it's two options then, waiving financing contingency or terminating. Yes, that's correct. So if Callie's question is on the, on the um, low, notice of low appraisal and that contingency, if, if it's a low appraisal, comes in at 95,000, you had an agreement for 100,000, and you give notice of low appraisal to the seller, and the seller says we're not changing, then you only have two options, and that would be either to proceed and waive the financing contingency, or to terminate the agreement. There is no option for you to go back and forth and back and forth. There is no option for you to go back and go, well, could you please this, right? There's really nothing against, now remember, you have to provide, if you're going to provide notice of low appraisal, you have to do it within three days, right? That's, that's in the contract, you have to do that. There's nothing saying that you can't reach out within those three days to the listing agent as the buyer's agent and say, hey, we got a low appraisal, what do you guys want to do, right? Because if we give notice like we want to and need to, there's only two options for us and uh, we're not going to pay for our financing. So if, Let's see if we can verbally kind of get to a place where we're both kind of feeling good about this, right? There's nothing stopping you from doing that. In fact, that might not be a bad idea. Good, good question. Uh, Nadine, did you, did I see yeah, your so hand? so if they're waiving the financing contingency, then they're saying that they can just pay for it in cash going forward? No, that, okay, good question. So Nadine says, hey, if they're waiving their financing contingency, is that just saying that they can pay for it in cash? Great question. Answer is no, not at all. What they're saying is that we will not be able to get out of this transaction any longer if we if we fail to be able to get our financing without without putting their earnest money in jeopardy. So let's let's so let's let's rabbit hole this for a second. So you give notice of low appraisal. I say as the listing agent or the, the seller, no, we're not doing anything. You as the buyer, let's say we're 10 days before closing. You as the buyer have a decision to make. We either terminate or we waive our financing contingency, okay? So what do you do? You call the lender, you ask the lender, hey look, we either have to terminate or we have to waive. How, how good are we, right? How, how sure are you that we're gonna close this thing and close it on time, right? Because we no longer will have our financing contingency to retain our earnest money, right? So, you, you know at that point where you are on the appraisal, right? 
you know where you are there, so you're in a pretty good spot. But do things come up last minute? Absolutely they do, no question they do. So are you putting yourself at risk? Absolutely. But are you saying you're gonna buy it cash? No. Are you saying that you're for sure gonna buy it? Well, no, not exactly. But what you are saying is, is I'm gonna for sure buy it or I'm gonna pretty sure give you my earnest money. That is what you're saying. Okay, so if the, if the appraiser, I mean, if you waive it and then the appraiser comes in love, you just make up the difference on the appraiser. If you wait, okay, so so the, the, the follow up question to that is, is okay, so the appraisal comes in low at 95000 on a $100,000 example. It comes in low, and you, as the buyer, utilize your option to not share, right? To not share the notice of low appraisal. Then, what are you doing? You're, you're moving to closing and you're saying on top of whatever money you're gonna put down for that $100,000 house, let's say it was 20% 20, 20 down, you're gonna bring $20,000 as your down payment, but now because that appraisal was low, you're also gonna bring an additional $5,000 to cover the difference in the low appraisal. You're gonna do that in lieu of giving notice of low appraisal. Yes, which is absolutely your option, and again, it, uh, is is a very viable and probably oftentimes your best move because then you don't handcuff yourself to having to waive your financing contingency to continue if the seller will not do anything for you. Good, good questions. More questions in here. Um, yes. So you were saying at one point that uh, the lender could could ask for an appraisal and that sort of thing. It doesn't always happen, but they could ask for one. The, so okay, so the question is, did I say that the that the lender could ask for an appraisal that doesn't have a, no, it's not the appraisal. The, the appraisal will happen. Mm -hmm. The appraisal is certain okay. when you get a loan. What, what we were talking about, it's very easy to, to confuse the two, is the inspection. Oh, the inspection. That's right. The lender could ask for a further inspection on something that they saw that would keep them from lending on the property. So if they came out for the appraisal and they saw that there was a major issue with something, the, the septic tank is dug up and sitting on the, you know, <laughs> on the property, they may ask for an inspection to do with that, right? So that's a good question, yes. Um, any other questions in this room? Yes, John. Uh, so I just wanted to get clarification on the uh, loan information and seller's right to terminate. Sure. So if seller uh, requests some loan, the loan information, if buyer does respond within the three days uh, on their form that they're supposed to use, yes. then seller no longer has the right to give the, the right to terminate notice? No. That's a good question. Great question. Not accurate. Okay. So John's question is, hey, if the seller gives the notice, the 22 AL, saying, hey, we want to know where you are, okay? And the buyer reciprocates, as, they, as they're supposed to, within the three days by providing a 22 AP, the document that says, hey, we've done all these things, and we warrant that we've done them, and we've signed off on this. John's question is, does that then mean that the seller cannot come back after the 30 days if we're using the boilerplate, right? And, and give notice of termination, which again sounds really scary, but isn't necessarily scary, right? But does that mean, because the buyer gave them this information, does that mean that then the seller can't give that notice? And the answer is no. The seller absolutely is still within the right to do that. And as Annie had told us, it is really something that you need to be doing to protect your seller. Remember, this form is really, if you're not utilizing those options, right? The 22 AL, right? To ask for permission and the 22 AR, right? If you're not, or I'm sorry, the AN, which is uh, the one that, uh, that uh, allows the buyer to, or the seller to enact the three days to terminate. If you're not utilizing those at all, then this entire document is slanted for the buyer, right? It gives the buyer the option to do anything and everything and the seller the option to do nothing. So those two portions of this really are the seller's opportunity to take some control as well and not to be completely on the low ground. If things go bad, they can actually make action. So I'm, I'm so confused about why you would send this in. What do you need to send this in? Send what? I, uh, the, why, why, right, right to terminate. Why would you? Why would you send a right to terminate? 
yeah. as a seller. Yo, after 30 days, why would you for closing in like two weeks, why would you send the right to terminate? Because within, okay, so the question is, why would you send a loan to, ter uh, uh, um, why would you send the notice uh, to terminate if, say, the 30 days were up, but you still had two weeks before closing, and you were happy with the transaction as a seller? Yeah, why would you send that? The reason is very simple. Most of the time, you would be happy, but you would still send it because you don't know what's going to happen. And in order to terminate as a seller, you have to have given them the three days notice, right? You have to give them that notice. So what happens when you are now three days or five days from closing and you call the lender because you, you have permission to do that. You call the lender, the lender's like, oh my gosh, I've not heard from this, the, the buyers in the last two weeks and I need forms, and they've just gone AWOL. What do you do, right? So this allows you the opportunity to make action as a seller. It gives you some control of what's going on in the situation. Do we have questions from Burian? Yeah, yeah. Oh, let's, let's bring you back out. Again, I know we're over our, our hour. This is a really meaty form. If you've got to skate out, I totally get it. If you want to stick around and listen to more questions, I'll stay and answer all the questions you have. Virian, did you catch that? No, we were just discussing as well. Yes, we were listening to your 30-day notice and why the benefit, but you just addressed it, so I think we're feeling okay with that answer. Good. Okay, fantastic. Do you have any other questions over there? I think we're good. We're good over there. Any more questions in this room? We're good here. Thank you, thank you, everybody. I appreciate your extra time this morning, but I think it was worth it to get into uh, this form. I think this was an awesome one to start with. So, good. If you got other questions that come up through the day or the week or the month, feel free to give me a call. Talk to Russ, Milani, myself. Uh, whatever you need, we're here for you. So thanks, everybody.